and thanks for joining us um, with Wollstonecraftivism for the programme for this week. Um, so each week you've been meeting different creatives and learning about their work and how they um, use their artwork to talk about their politics. And this week we have got Sade and Anna. So Sade is an artist and designer and Anna is a filmmaker and photographer. And they work individually, but they also work together um, as co-founders for the Black Exchanges. So we're going to be asking um, Sade and Anna some questions um, about their work. And then at the end of that, we're going to be setting you a challenge so that you can create your own piece of work inspired by Sade and Anna's work. So thank you so much Sade and Anna for coming and talking to us today. And so I've got some questions about your work. And the first one um, is for you Sade, but Anna also if you want to talk about that too, then that would be great. So Sade, um, your work, which would be great to hear a bit more about, and um, you speak a lot about conformity. Um, what kind of advice would you give young people about conformity? Um, and can you talk about how you've shown that in your work? Um, I think for me, I, the conformity aspect came when I was going to art school. Even though it's meant to be a space where you're able to be freely expression in how you are, there was even a programme as to how you should express yourself as an artist, whether that was design, whether that's photography, there's always a curriculum and a way that is meant to be seen as the correct way. So I felt as an artist very restricted and I mm. felt I was always having to conform to suit them in order to basically get the grade that you need to progress or be um, seen as established or successful within the arts industry. With that, I ended up making my own concept, which I called anti-claim because I basically kept stating that everyone had just become claims. So I felt very um, uncomfortable trying to express myself naturally and always having people higher up or people who are seen as established basically try to not tear you apart but try to dictate how things should be in order for you to flourish and with that I made my own concept so I think most especially younger children and just people in general if they feel that they're being controlled and you're unable to express yourself freely it's about trying to not conform and create your own space or even have a collective or community of people who also have the same passions and expressions as you so that you can come together and express yourselves as a collective. Because if you're trying to do that as one, but everybody else is, has a clone-like aspect and tries to con basically conform within themselves, you then start to feel that you're constantly going up against the wall mm. or you start to feel quite frustrated within yourself that you're not able to express yourself thoroughly. But if you have a community or a group of people, or then able to flourish together. But I think it's mainly about just trying to find your own independence and not allowing even people higher up to push you down in some way. Because at the end of the day, we're all individuals and it becomes very tedious and boring if everybody begins to start just mirroring one another. Mm. Yeah, that kind of, it kind of sounds like um, what you're talking about a bit there as well is like how you measure your kind of success Mm -hmm. that you know there's there's certain established ways of saying this person is good at this or this person is good at that and you're kind of working against that idea yeah it's, it's necessary because at the end of the day i feel like though it's, especially me doing fashion design high fashion is very cliquey it's very what's trending and it's mm. it's, it's not necessarily a wearable art it's more what sells and what's popular so with that, you, though you have elements of how you are seen as established, whether you're featured in a magazine, whether you're featured in Vogue, or you've got the right names in your campaign, et cetera, you just have to try and find your own roots and mm. do it authentically. Because even if it's not necessarily mainstream, because you are doing it authentically and you have your own concept, you then will start to attract the right audience that will support your work. Though it may be slower, don't get me wrong, mm. you're doing something conceptual, especially with me doing more avant-garde designs it's not mainstream, so your clientele is smaller, but that's with any practice. If you're doing something that's not mainstream, it won't necessarily be as successful as quick, but you will, if you are authentic, you will start to build your own clientele in that way. You don't have to then be controlled or dictated to by people who are seen as established because you then become established because you are authentic in your own brand. I think that's a wonderful lesson for young people to learn. Um, I think especially because young people are uh, in that kind of system for a very early age. I mean, at school, that's what you're taught, isn't it? If you 
if you're at school, if you do this, this and this, and you get this grade, then you're successful. And, and I think that um, if, you know, learning about that is a really good thing to learn from a young age, because, for example, a lot of people struggle at school, don't they? And then maybe come out thinking, oh, well, I'm not successful or I'm not clever and I can't do that. And that's very, that's not the case at all, is it? They're just good at many other different things. Um, Anna, do you want to talk a bit about that too? About, um, about like conformity or your experience with, with the art world, doing the work that you want to make? Um, well, I guess um, from starting from my experience um, at art school, um, I, I, was, I was very conscious of, of not fitting in um, and um it it being a space that wasn't diverse and i feel like wasn't really a, a space um designed um to um explore your identity and it wasn't it wasn't really encouraged so i feel for me like my my creative practice kind of really really began to develop after art school where i where i kind of had to kind of um, look back at myself again and and understand like why I was actually making work in the first place because I think in in some cases like I think art school can either it's like kind of they have a little bit of a make or break attitude um, <laughs> and um, so like I I kind of I didn't feel like it it pushed me to do my best work if anything I probably was trying to conform in terms of trying to make work that I thought would please my tutor mm. um, rather than actually making the kind of work I wanted to make um, so so I actually studied graphic design but then after um, I graduated then I started like assisting photographers and stuff and then I kind of found a medium that I enjoyed working within and then it was kind of now I now I have a medium like what is my message um, and what would I like what would I like to say with my work um, and in, in terms of like doing photography um, I've always um, try to um, showcase and celebrate um, black models and black artists. Um, primarily when, when I started um, even approaching model agencies and stuff and they'd, they'd send you a, a package of like the available models and there wouldn't be um, anybody in the package um, who wasn't white. So in, in that sense, then I kind of started casting my own models and, and looking, um, looking to, to create, like, I think the words, I would say representation because representation is very important, but it's, it's, it's become a word that gets kind of thrown around so casually now. Um, and like, I think it often like lacks the intention behind the meaning of the word, because for me, representation doesn't mean just a photograph of somebody who looks like me it means that the team behind it um, also reflect or understand the culture or the reasons why they're showcasing that um, so for me in in my photography and my magazine um, it's been about celebrating black beauty and black joy and then um, more recently I've, as I've moved into filmmaking it's been more about um, narratives in our stories because i think as well as we want to see representations in terms of physical um like our voices are extremely important and need to be heard so i think i think m uh, making my filmmaking work is just contributing to a multitude of voices because i think mm. we can often get put into a category or be um thought as being um mon monolithic but um there are a multitude of different experiences and so and thus we need a multitude of artists from different experiences and different voices to tell those stories mm. um so i think my work kind of sits as in and what one from one perspective that's great thank you anna and it actually kind of leads on to my next question which is about the power of the image although you said that you've you kind of evolved your work to to also include words and you know and, and moving towards that kind of thing but the work that both of you do is very aesthetic 
driven and, and images are obviously very powerful. And I just wondered, you know, if you're politically driven, if you have a, a cause that you want to highlight or talk about, like you said, Anna, there's many different ways that you can do that. But the ways that you both do that is through your creative pursuits. It's through your artwork and image is very important with that. Can you talk a bit about about that why is it why image why the work that you do how does that help share that kind of thing and what 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 does it do well with that that maybe other forms wouldn't do I mean like you said Anna I think it takes lots of different types of work and lots of different voices to to do that but you know the work that you do is important individually and, and what kind of um what kind of power does that work have I think Im image is very important because I think I remember even from my like early ex ex experiences of um, going into gallery spaces and not, not seeing images that reflected me or my family or, or people I knew. Um, and I, th I think, I think is the idea of, image and even beauty and art and aesthetics um, can can in a sense and, and fashion can seem superficial to an extent um, to have a preoccupation with beauty but also at the same time um, it, I think it plays into how how in which you see yourself in the world and I think it's important to have a pride in yourself and to see a reflection of of people who look like you who are also proud of themselves and I guess like beauty is is just one aspect of that. A lot of your photography work is is um, around this particular issue isn't it Anna and um, do you want to talk a bit about some of that work perhaps? Well in terms of my photography, like I've always been very inspired and always loved very classic um, art in terms of like pre-Raphaelites, very kind of stereotypical images of of beauty. So I think um, I, it's 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 had to be for me to try and have a shift in my mentality in looking at what I'm looking at for inspiration. And because I think lots of times um, you do get black artists who in essentially um, almost reappropriate Western art to incorporate black people within it. Right. Um, I, um, I could name a few people, but I feel like maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think um so i've been consciously trying to look at um different black artists um and how um they are presenting their work in terms of looking for inspiration obviously when i say looking for inspiration obviously not copying but we all we all take in um visuals that we see huh. and it reflects back in our practice um but like in um, in the recent issue of my magazine, um, the cover story, um, I shot um, um, a group of friends, and um, the shoot was inspired by the artist um, Barclay Hendricks, and looking at the composition in terms of the color palettes, um, the clothes that that um, his subjects would wear. So I think it it's it's about looking back at even like his historical um, imagery of even finding like the classic painting of um, Dido Bell, for instance, finding mm -hmm. um, imagery that does already have black subjects in rather than just looking at classical Western art and thinking, how am I now projecting that into my practice? Because I think that that go, it's, it, I think it's interesting as a black artist um, who who is who has been brought up in England and had a Western education, mm -hmm. 
um, that's all that you're told is art. So I think it's, it's kind of about trying to re-educate yourself in terms of looking at outside just the mainstream of what's told to you as art and, and kind of like reflecting that back in my practice and making sure that it feels like it, it is definitely my own gaze that mm. I maybe work from. Shade, do you want to talk, talk to us a, a little bit about your work in, in this aspect? Um, I think, I think for me, when it comes to the output, I've always felt that going, especially going to London College of Fashion, it was always put on a pedestal. It's, it's, it's like alongside Central St. Martins. It was always meant to be the place where you would feel most creative. But in all honesty, I felt most creative at dressmaking classes or through exploring through exploring galleries and even just ex ex exploring life. I would use my mm. life experiences. And if I were perhaps feeling a certain way, I would use that emotion as my inspiration. I wouldn't ever really, I, I was very, um, I was very paranoid about being so influenced by pre-existing art. So for me, doing fashion design, I would never look at other fashion designers. Though I was very inspired by how you know the fashion industry's Western idols, which were John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, these were all um, white men. But I didn't look at them as because they do not look like me, I can't be inspired. For me, I've always been inspired by different cultures, different people, but when it comes to the output that I create, it was usually the emotion that I would feel from looking at a garment or a painting. So I think when it comes to creating, it's not necessarily about how the Western educational system would always talk to you about, you know, 1930s, New Look, Chanel, Dior. They always give you pre-existing things that have gone rather than maybe, I don't know, like a, a colour. How does this mm. kind of feel? It's very old systemic ways of they're going to give you historical um, designers that they're proud of and then you should basically try to make something similar but then if it's too similar you're copying but then the foundations that they're giving you mm. are, are basically trying to indicate to you if it's not looking like this then you're basically not a designer like for instance with me when I was um, on my first year at university I was selected as the only person from foundation year to be platformed at the press day show and though it was a great achievement for me, my tutor didn't like the fact that I was selected because I didn't um, finish my scenes the way you're meant to do it. Oh. So, like, but because the director of London College of Fashion liked my work, he literally mm. said, he's um, Rob Phillips, he's crazy, he's fun. But he basically said, I don't care what your tutor thinks. It doesn't have to be done this way for it to be cast mm. out as a garment. And even how I create garments, I don't do things based on the mass production way of front bodice, back bodice, seam hair, seam hair. I drape everything I do on a mannequin. And though some people may find that not design or it's not the right way, if you actually look at couture, which is everything that everyone aspires to be able to accomplish in fashion, how I actually drape is couture techniques. I learned that when I was 14, going to a dressmaking class, not whilst I was at London College of Fashion. So I think it's about people always have this idea as to how you should be as an artist, as a photographer, as a film director, as whatever. But quite frankly, art is meant to be expression and it should be unique to how you see things. Mm. And I think, especially as human beings, image is very powerful because of course, knowledge and reading and literature, et cetera, does enable you to have more knowledge to be able to share with others and just have a higher IQ, to be quite frank. But one thing we all have in common, especially from when you're, you're born, image is the first thing you see mm. that enables you to express yourself. You're inspired instantly through image because it's, it's instant. You know, if you're reading something, it, you then have an idea, it then develops. But image itself is, in my opinion, more powerful. Mm. Um, so I think when I create my images, when I then started to develop photography, because I, I originally had um, a photographer called Josh Fo who helped me develop Antipane, which is the brand that I have in terms of fashion design. But when I then began to do my own photography, for me, it was more about trying to capture emotion within the image and it not necessarily just being fashion design, because I feel like fashion design itself does water down wearable art. For me, it was more about expressing how you 
fill with emotion through draping a garment and then that image being more than just a campaign because even then it's all you know it's trending it's spring summer mm. campaigns and it's it's all it's all ticking a box it no longer becomes in my opinion of value because it's now just become a product to be sold and i think through image itself especially with my work it's very um it's, it's avant-garde it's not high fashion so i'm more in, inspired by um, what people, my, my mother would have said very dark, but <laughs> for me, it's more a case of how fashion is for women's wear. It's always been florals, um, mm. velvet, very palatable, feminine, whatever feminine even means, um, colorway palettes. But I was always more inspired by things that were stereotypically seen as dark or masculine. And I think the image that I would create rather than trying to go into the fashion industry and try to approach casts, casts that they would try to give to, like Anna said, packages. I wasn't, I didn't want to always conform to their way or conform to the way women's are meant to be seen. So for me, if I'm making a dress, I don't mm. really think that it needs to be on a woman. It can be from whoever. And with that image itself, I feel like you can be, not that I ever felt it was activism within an image, but yeah. because basically didn't conform to society in any way, shape or form. Alone, the image was more than just a garment. So mm. I think it's about recognizing the power in the image rather than thinking the power is in the industry to make your image be actually established, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and, and that kind of brings me to the work that you do together as co-founders of Black Exchanges. I mean, it'd be really interesting to hear a bit about how you came up with the idea and, 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 what, and why you thought it was important and, and what you wanted to, and what you have achieved and what you're gonna do in the future. But I suppose the, the thing that links that as well is, is what you were talking about there, Shade, about kind of unlearning, I feel like is the wrong word because you're learning so much through that process of unlearning, but um, mm -hmm. about you know moving out of a framework that you've been handed and saying, no, I don't want to be within those boxes or what those markers of success. And, and you, like you were saying, Shade there, which was fascinating about the fashion industry, um, about, you know, these are some successful things before, so use them for inspiration. And you, you, you actually say, no, I want to look at different things for inspiration. Um, do you want to talk a bit about, um, yeah, how, how Black Exchanges, the Black Exchanges came about and, and what it is that you're doing with that? Well, it was it was really authentic like Anna and I became friends only like we always feel like we've been friends forever but we've only been friends for like a year and a bit now oh wow yeah which is literally like she stuck with me um <laughs> but I it all stemmed from us both whenever we would meet we would usually always have conversations about industry and then about mm. um ancestry and we were both reading um a book Natives Akala I think I, I was just so fascinated by how, though Akala is extremely knowledgeable, as we know, in terms of the book itself, it's, it's formal, but informal. So it's a very easy read and, mm -hmm. and feeling, I think, somewhat inspired by the way that he was able to articulate himself, himself in a way that enabled you to recognize there's so many things you don't know about your history, especially me being a, a mixed race person and Anna also being mixed race, though we are black. Uh, our heritage, we still are having to relearn ourselves because even our, well, especially I could talk on my behalf, my mother knew of her ancestry, but even then it was just, she was Jamaican. But you're not just Jamaican, you're African. Mm. Where in Africa are you from? What tribe are you from? And having this, um, this determination to try and actually know of our history, I think it, it did connect us because we were both on that journey. Though we had friends who were black, Asian, European, whatever, when it comes to being mixed race and then being black on top of that, there's, um, there's an, an element of slight, for me it was slight confusion because I was having to relearn my ancestry through being raised by a single mother and not having the connect with my father. And Anna also with a single mother, though we have connections to our family to some degree, we were having to basically up, up, untangle and, and relearn things together. And then when we were having conversations about history and, and why is it that our family may not know which tribe they're from, et cetera, we then began to realize we were on the journey, the same journey of trying to understand our history and, and know where we're going. Because I know it's very cliche, but that concept of knowing where you come from to know where you're going, it, it really does apply. 
so with that we decided that we can't be the only people having these intense conversations about the Native Zakala book as well as um, history with our ancestry in Jamaica as well as being a mixed race person within a very we both, both went to like private schools so even then within private institutions it's predominant mm. white so then having to understand how you navigate yourself through that or even being a mixed race person personally and navigating through a black community even then because of colorism there's so there's so many things mm. that, that apply but it was amazing to be able to have a friend that was going through the same thing but then we recognize that we can't be the only ones and it'll be amazing to have a space and a collective of people who are perhaps also not necessarily trying to go through the the mixed race black experience but just the black experience of being a black person within a western european country and having to navigate through only having historical knowledge of of somebody who is who doesn't look like you because quite frankly in our history books we're not taught about jamaican um, you're not taught about Nambia genocide, you're not, you're, not, you're not taught about all of these things that come to play medical apartheid. Although they are some dark things, there are also some beautiful, rich things that we were learning that aren't implemented in the history books. And with that, we decided that it was best to try and learn, relearn these things. But rather than being, not selfish, but rather than just keeping that knowledge for ourselves, actually sharing it with others as well as having other people if they're more on a journey more forward than us they can share it with us so it was mainly about a mm. rather than it being two girls on a night out having a drink getting deep we were able to um make it more i don't want to call it a classroom like because it's not meant to be we're not teachers we're literally learning as we're going literally yeah. um but about having a collective of people having these open discussions so it just naturally evolved, I think, through our own conversations. Yeah, I, I think this kind of idea of, of creating community um, by having these conversations, um, because I, I think even, even in the UK, there are different groups and divides within, within the black community with things like colorism, um, People, people are from. You've got people who are from the Caribbean. You've got people who are uh, from Africa. Even though from, we from, we are from the Caribbean, we are from Africa too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think it's like I think with it, essentially with the diaspora, we're all we're all coming back to our history, and we're and there's different levels of separation from like like Shade was saying from. You have your personal um, family disconnect. I, I had that myself of, of even just trying to find things, you know, one or two generations back, never mind um, much further back than that. And I think kind of, of, of understanding um, specifically black, black British history was quite important for me as well, because I think when you're taught about black history, it's primarily talked about in terms of American history. And I think, um, I think it's very important for everybody to understand the context of, if we're living in the UK, we're all here as a community and understanding um, the, the history of, of how, um, of how um, Caribbean communities came to the UK, of understanding things like the Windrush. Um, so, I, and, and then as well of, tr of trying to learn history pre, pre colonization. So, there's a lot of history to learn. Oh, <laughs> so, it, so, it's a long journey. <laughs> um, but I think that's the, the, the nice idea of community and with Black Exchange, the name Exchange was because it was supposed to be an exchange of knowledge, of coming together and sharing what we know and our experiences um, to enrich in each other. And mm. um, yeah, that's that's great. And is there any anything else you want to say about the Black Exchanges and it maybe in terms of some of the work that you've already done and maybe some of the work that you're looking to do in the future? Well, we did our first event um, in February, like on early March, February. That was literally our first event. Down. Literally, we did it. It was incredible because, again, um, I think 
I think we didn't expect the turnout to be as good as it was because we literally only just did um, some posters around the neighborhoods that I grew up in and shared it on social. But again, like I said, though, I, though we have our own social circles, when it comes to these conversations, really the only person I have deep conversations with about this is Anna. So when it came to us having the event, my social circles, not necessarily, it necessarily didn't apply to them. So when we then put it all on event by and we had everyone turn up, it was, it was incredible. But then, mm. though it was a bit nerve wracking because it went from us having a chat in, in our houses to there was about 50, 60 of people who wanted to hear us talk. Yeah. So I, at first it was a little bit, okay, <laughs> let's do this. But it, the, the end result was amazing because people were sharing um, their experiences and their issues within our community as well as issues within the western community and it, it was it was very um almost uh what's that term um therapeutic because you recognize that you weren't the only person having these perhaps um struggles or having these ideas or or just having been able to share it with, with amongst the community of people it mm -hmm. enabled us to all feel like we were almost like a family we were laughing we were sometimes a bit frustrated and angry but it was a mixture of different emotions and then at the end people were able to connect and communicate and network so it's like it started to unravel and unfold without us even having to um lead people it just mm -hmm. all happened quite naturally but then lockdown happened <laughs> and that basically it paused our ability to have these exchanges with an audience yeah. and I, so we have been trying to do um, Instagram lives which have been really amazing we've been forming allies of information and other people having us as a resource resource mm -hmm. to not necessarily learn from because again I keep always saying we're not teachers we're literally learning as we're going but to see that our community, whether it's allies, whether it's within our community, feeling that our voice is opening their mindset or enabling them to do better as a human being. Um, I think that's how we've been able to continue creating some element of change without necessarily expecting to. It's mm. all, especially after the Black Lives Matter protests and everything that's been happening worldwide, um, we didn't personally want to initiate a protest ourselves because we're very aware the pandemic is extremely serious however we took it upon ourselves to go independently to support and then with that um we were able to then even have a more wider audience of allies and, and of people from the community who felt that we weren't just two people screaming our frustrations or trying to be united with everybody who has a collective opinion on how society is treating black people but because we actually have something to say um, outside of a protest, I think that's where we've been able to connect with other people mm. and we can then implement the strategy to go there and after. But I think it will always be the foundation will always be to have exchanges and conversations because I think, though I said previously, image is very powerful when it comes to relearning the amount of history that we haven't been taught. Yeah. It needs to be with exchanges, it needs to be with words because an image or a painting is not going to illustrate um, pre-colonial life or pre-slavery there's so many things that we need to voice and converse about but I think with that we're then able to do different projects that will bring people together but we just have to navigate how that's going to all be approachable but I think things like um, like exhibitions that we can then bring image into it again and mm. develop film as well as photography, but there's so many different projects, dance, expression, there's so many different things that we can now include, but it's just about being able to reassure people that they're safe, because of course we can't just unfold everything all in one go, we still have to do it stage by stage. Yeah, definitely. Anna, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're, you're thinking that you want to do in the future, or some of the things that you've got planned? Um, yeah, um, well, we're always big on ideas at Black Exchange. <laughs> um, no, I think, yeah, like Shade is saying, um, our conversations are central and so important. Um, but like, I think a part, a part of it is really that conversations lead to action. Um, and that um, it's not, it's not pure, purely empty words. 
I think it, it's important for for people to gather and for the com for the conversation to develop amongst people and for them people to go outside the conversation and continue having these conversations with their their friends and families. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think community is really important, and so some of the um, initiatives that we're moving forward are. Um, workshops um including like dance workshops um spoke spoken words events um we've we're, we're having a specifically a cutie pock um initiative which will um be providing safe spaces for creative outlets um for um young queer poc um, people. Um, we are also um, working towards having a, a pop-up library available um, where we can have a collection of resources um, because as, as much as yes Google is out there it's, it's always nice to have access to physical books mm. Um, and, I, and I think it's important even just to be able to go into a space and to see um, rich history laid out um, in the form of a multitude of books is beautiful because um, I think learning and knowledge is, is very key to um, black exchange so I think although lots of the workshops and things we're doing are creative expressions um, behind that is kind of um, underpinned by conversations and um, education because this is predominantly young people that are going to be taking part in this project, is there anything else that you want to, you know, say to younger people about your work, about the things that you think are important, about the changes that you're trying to make in the world that you think are important things that they should kind of take away or think on? Or like you said, Anna, it's about education. It's about having those conversations, but also then that turning into action or change or different ways of behaving or thinking about things. Well, well, I think um, art is is a great form of activism. I think um, within, whilst you're educating yourself and you're learning things, and I think also because lots of the times when you are relearning stuff, some of some of the history is is quite intense and mm. is is hard to learn. And so I think having a creative output in order to express express those emotions. And, and, also, and also to share, like, I think, um, although when we talk about art, we talk about visuals and aesthetics, I think, I think art can have a greater purpose in terms of, of, of telling messages, of telling stories. Um, and I think when we talk a lot about um, history, I think we also have to remember we are, we are living history currently. So I think, it's important to document our experiences and our mm. communities um, that we're living through now um, through, 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 work, through our creative practices. I think it's also about, you, you, you mentioned the, how we're trying to, um, how we're able to change the world. I, I, personally, um, <laughs> I personally don't think, though it would be incredible, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, um, not not to sound like melodramatic, but um, or, or or very dark. But, um, <laughs> middle name, sorry. Um, I personally don't think that we're trying to necessarily change the world with Black Exchange because I'm I'm a very realistic person, and I do believe, unfortunately, um, as a Black community and talking on behalf of the Black Native American community, we have been oppressed as people for more than four hundred plus years. So for me to live in my lifetime, even if I were to make it to, to 80 or 90, I don't believe I'm going to see the change that is needed for the world to actually treat everybody equally. Um, however, I think it's more about if we as individuals are trying to unlearn history that is false, because I've always said it, and it's almost a broken record, but history, when it's written, is written by the winners. It will never indicate the full truth because quite frankly if you have done something dark 
you are not willing to then express mm. everything um, authentically or honestly, because otherwise the entire world will see you as indifferent or see you as a, a not a very nice person. Um, but this concept of Britain being Great Britain, there was not much great about it in terms of the history that it actually has done in terms of colonizing the majority of the world. I think there's only um, 20 countries in the world that Britain hasn't colonized. So for me to then expect great and black exchanges is now going to change the world, it's not realistic. I think it's more about relearning your history, sharing the history that you have relearned and making history and then passing it down to the younger generation. Mm. I feel like even me being at 28, the younger generation, if they're seeing people who are slightly older who are trying to navigate through life in the best way that they can. Like we will make mistakes. Again, like I said, Anna and I created this project only in February. So we are literally learning as we're going. But I think us not having this um, really high extreme expectation of ourselves, because again, we are also artists first and Black Exchange is an extension of who we are. But if we can create community, which will enable the younger generation to see that I do not have to limit myself because of how the western world tries to put me in in terms of the media it seems whenever you're successful as a black or or a latinx person it's through um music you're either an entertainer or there's all these don't get me wrong there are great accomplishments but it's mm. not sports and entertainment that black or brown people can be successful in so i think through black exchanges we can't change the world but we can hopefully create a space that will enable people who look like us, as well as allies, to recognise there are more, there's more to us than the history that you have been taught. And there's more to us that we can aspire to be as great as everyone should be able to aspire to be equally. I think it's more about making the changes of our mindsets because we can, we can do that. We have done that. We've seen that. But changing the world, like, that, that's, that's, a big, <laughs> that's a big ask. And to be honest, um, as much as we have been labelled activists and that since I don't even call myself that I personally am just trying to live be mm. my truth and if people want to if people may feel inspired to live their truth also through that with the younger generation then we're doing something great but I don't think I would never call myself a role model and I don't think Anna would either because we're still learning as we're going you know I think it's more no, about I... people's mindsets into thinking they can aspire to be more than the world has basically the platform to them that they are you know Definitely. I thank you so much for that, Shada, because I think that's a really important lesson and something to keep in mind, although it's hard to accept, I think, that um, some of those changes that you're maybe hoping will happen or, or work, putting work in to, to hope that that happen, like you said, you might not see them in, in your lifetime. And a lot of times, those people, those change makers, in their time when they were around, were you know um the media will have said that they they're troublemakers and and they would life would have been difficult and people would have been saying oh they're not doing this right and then oh they're terrible people and then as time passes then we can we have hindsight and we can look back and think that oh well what they did was wonderful or you know perhaps not everything they did was great but in a on a whole it, it tried to work towards making the world a fairer place and things like that and i think that's something that um can be very disheartening if you're an activist or if you just care about a particular cause that uh, knowing that um sometimes people are always going to not agree with that but that maybe in the future you might make it, it better for future generations i think is an important um thing to keep in mind especially when when it gets difficult or you feel like you're fighting against the grain a lot and no one's really listening Mm. But I think that's where it's great with Black Exchange is where we're able to create a community, not necessarily just a nun, but anybody who wishes that things will be different. If they're, if they're within a community of people who all hope that things can be different or all have the same mindset as them in terms of wanting there to be change, even if you are having days where, you know, you might feel extremely low because of how your family treating you or how society is treating people of colour because you have a collective of people who are also aspiring for things to be different, that can help change your mindset and recognizing that there is a glimmer of hope, you know? But I think 
there, there are so many people who, who wish for there to be change. And I think the younger generation, or even our generation, I think we'll do our bit, but the younger generation, the generation after them will be the ones mm. that actually see the change. But I think, I think making spaces for people that all aspire for there to be change is quite frankly going to be the thing that will make everybody move forward. Because if there's just one of you, that's great. And I do believe in leading yourself. You shouldn't have to be amongst a group of people to feel like things will change. But at the same time, when you do have a collective of people behind you or standing next to you, should I say, it will, it will give you a sense of, um, of hope. And I think that's what we all need at the moment because it's, it's quite, there's a lot happening in the world, but we do have to have an element of hope. Otherwise we just won't be able to aspire to see through it, you know? Mm. And um, thank you so much for, for doing that and sharing that. I think that was uh, a really interesting, it's going to be a really interesting one. And it'd be great to see what the kids come up with too. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.